Hello and welcome everyone to Stories That Connect Us. This is Mary Rufo. I am the co-VP for membership for NJAGC, New Jersey Association for Gifted Children. It is a real pleasure to welcome each and every one of you today for what I would consider to be an incredible opportunity, uh, the chance to share some time with an icon with an individual that has been associated with gifted education for many years. The successes that this man has brought to gifted education uh, are so many that it would take me uh, quite a long time to list, uh, but I'm going to do my best to introduce uh, this this gentleman, once again, I refer to him as an icon, someone that um, I have the great pleasure of interview, uh, interviewing today, Dr. Joseph Renzulli. Uh, Dr. Renzulli, it is a pleasure to be with you on behalf of the board members, trustees, and membership. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. and Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Renzulli. Before we get started with your interview, I would like to uh, share with the audience a little bit of background about yourself. Dr. Renzulli is a leader and pioneer in gifted education and applying the pedagogy of gifted education teaching strategies to all students. The American Psychological Association named him among the 25 most influential psychologists in the world. He received the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Award for Innovation in Education, considered by many to be the Nobel for Educators, and was a consultant to the White House Task Force on Education of the Gifted and Talented. His work on the three-ring conception of giftedness, the enrichment triad model, and curriculum compacting and differentiation were pioneering efforts in the 1970s. And he has contributed hundreds of books, book chapters, articles, and monographs to the professional literature, many of which have been translated into other languages. Dr. Renzulli has received more than $50 million in research grants and several million dollars of additional funding for professional development and service projects. Dr. Renzulli established the University of Connecticut's annual Confertu program with fellow educational psychology professor, professor excuse me, Sally Reese. This summer institute on enrichment-based differentiated teaching has served more than 35,000 teachers from around the world since 1978. Dr. Renzulli also established the UConn Mentor uh, Connection, a summer program that enables high potential high school students to work side by side with leading scientists, historians and artists, and other leading edge university researchers. He is also the founder, along with Dr. Reese, of the Joseph Renzulli Gifted and Talented Academy in Hartford, Connecticut, which has become a model for local and national urban school reform for high potential, a low income students. Um, his most recent work is on online personalized learning program that provides profiles of each student's academic strengths, interests, learning styles, and preferred mode of expression. This unique program also has a search engine that matches uh, multiply coded resources with student profiles. Teachers also use this program to select and infuse high engagement enrichment activities to and uh, any all standardized curriculum topics. I'm speaking of the Renzulli Learning Program. And at the University of Connecticut, uh, under the NIEG School of Education is where the Renzulli Center for Creativity, Gifted Education, and Talent Development exists. Their motto is enjoyment, 
engagement and enthusiasm for learning. Dr. Renzulli, I could add so much more to this introduction, sir, um, but I hope that I've done you um, really the service that, that you are so deserving of. Stories That Connect Us is really an opportunity for NJAGC to bring to the audience uh, just a look inside, a personal look inside to an individual's life story, um, one that we can really just share in this next hour with you to learn a little bit more about yourself and, and where things really got started. So while you call Connecticut your home, um, we are so excited here in New Jersey to call you one of our own because life for you started in the Garden State, in the state of New Jersey, correct? Correct. So, Dr. Renzulli, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to go back to when you were a little boy. You were, you grew up in a shore town, and there were some there were some really interesting and provocative times in your life that uh, started to shape the individual that you are today. I wonder if we could start there in learning a little bit about your life. Well, early childhood was very uh, influential on me. Uh, it was during the uh, Second World War. And uh, I know at nighttime, we would go down to the beach and we would see flashes on the horizon because convoys coming out of New York Harbor heading for North Africa oftentimes were picked off by German submarines and we would see big flashes and the next day the beach would be covered with what we called tar which was the oil that the ships used and so we all had a little pan of kerosene on our back porch that we would dip our feet in to wash the tar off before we came in the house so that's one of my early memories um Growing up uh, was uh, not an easy matter for me. Um, my father died when I was eight, and my mother was left with three un unruly children that she was forced to raise on welfare. And one of the things that I learned at an early age, uh, if you wanted something, you had to figure out a way about how to get it. And perhaps that's where a lot of my motivation comes from, and also the inclusion of task commitment in the three-ring conception of giftedness. When I was a kid, if I wanted a new pair of sneakers, because the cardboard was covering the holes in my present pair of sneakers, I went down to the beach and started collecting bottles for, at that time, a two-cent deposit. And when I collected the, enough bottles, I could get myself a new pair of sneakers. And I had a dozen other different jobs as a kid because it was very important to learn survival. And I think that those are the kinds of experiences that, again, travel with you through life. I still holler at my kids if they don't shut the light when they leave a room. Uh, and so uh, those experiences, I think, form your attitude, your character, whatever it may be. And uh, I think that uh, they're very, very important. It also reminds me of a favorite quotation, and it's something like that goes something like this. The only thing worse than having an unhappy childhood is having a too happy childhood. I think that, yes, we want to do all we can to give our children everything that they want and need and ask for and every advantage we can provide. But we also need to make sure that there are experiences where they're not always getting the, the gold medal or the trophy where they're not always completely successful. I think that we learn as much from those kinds of experiences as, again, the kinds of experiences that we are very successful at. Dr. Azuli, to have lost your father at such a young age and only imagine the type of woman that your mom must have been and, and the kinds of things that... Uh, she led you and your two siblings to really 
believe in? Is there something that has stayed with you over the years that your mom taught you? And obviously, and you're, you're laughing. <laughs> so, I mean, like, I know the part about shutting off the lights. I, I totally get that. And I also think that the fact that you incorporated, uh, you know, this task commitment into your three ring of a uh, conception of giftedness, it really circles back to to what you said about collecting bottles. But what is it that mom uh, really gave to you that you still hang on to today, please? Well, uh, again, I think it has to do with problem solving. Let me give you an example. Because we were on welfare, mom was not allowed to work, but there just wasn't enough income to be able to survive. And so she started uh, cleaning houses in a very wealthy town that was on the seashore. And um, the, uh, she was oftentimes driven home by the chauffeur in a very large limousine. Now, if the welfare lady was around, that was dangerous. And so we had a thing where one of my brothers, my older brother, uh, would stand at the corner if uh, the welfare lady was around. And uh, he would give me a signal. And then if the car was coming, I would signal the car and mom would stop. They would stop the car and mom would get out and walk the rest of the way home. So that if the welfare lady didn't see her, that she was working, we were able to get by with that. And so, again, I think it's it's problem solving uh, for what you consider to be important that. Uh, uh, is the thing that uh, mom taught us how to do. And, you know, problem solving has not, nor will it ever go away. But here you were, you know, as a young young child, just realizing what it, what you needed to do in order to just make it happen as a family to survive. Um, you know, and it, it's clear that she holds such a special place in your heart and in your life as well. Um, the other thing that, that mom knew, she was an immigrant, by the way, after dad died, uh, they spoke Italian to one another. My brothers and I had the job of teaching her English. But um, the other thing that she knew was important was education. She realized, even though she had a very limited education herself, that uh, the only way to get ahead in this world was through education. Incredible. And and that's actually such a great segue to where you found yourself as an undergraduate. Um, your undergraduate work was done at what was then known as Glasgow State College, uh, now Rowan University in Glasgow, New Jersey. Proud to say that that's where um, I my job is as for Glasgow Public Schools. And um, you went on to do your graduate work at Rutgers University. Um, speak a little bit, if you could, Dr. Renzulli, about your experiences um, at both of those locations. And if there was something um, in particular that occurred uh, at either location that really sticks with you today. Now, one of the things that uh, sticks in my mind is... Uh, a course that I was taking at Rutgers University um, called uh, Theories of Psychology. And um, the professor and I became good friends. We used to meet for dinner before my Thursday evening class. And um, one day she asked me uh, if I would review a manuscript that she was asked by a publisher to review. And uh, I thought, oh, God, you know, another another job in my very busy, because I was teaching at the time, my very busy schedule. And it was about that thick. And uh, I took it home and I started to turn pages in it. Well, I ended up staying up all night because I was so intrigued with that manuscript. And it was to become a very well-known book called Creativity and Intelligence by Getzels and Jackson, where they compared the two kinds of things. I was actually, my master's degree was in school psychology, and I was learning how to give and administer tests. 
And the whole idea of creativity became something that was really a central part of my early work. When I went on for my uh, doctorate at the University of Virginia, uh, Dr. Torrance, who became a great personal friend and mentor of mine, um, was uh, just beginning his work and uh, had developed what was at first called the Minnesota Test of Creative Thinking, later to become the very famous Torrance Test. And one of the things uh, I thought was there are activities that we can develop to prepare people to do well on the Torrance Test. And so I developed a what later became a five-book series called New Directions in Creativity uh, that dealt with the basic underlying Torrance and Guilford models, but it was all practical uh, examples, uh, classroom activities for teachers. And so those kinds of things uh, are very influential. I still have that beat-up old copy of the of my uh, very early uh receipt of a of a free copy of the book from my from my advisor that she sent me after it was published and she got the hundred dollar honorarium but I got a lot of motivation. <laughs> and it's it all started really with being asked to review, you know, this particular piece. Who you know, who would have thought that something like that would really change you know, your thinking um, and the way that you look at things. It, it, one never, one never, you know, I think that chance and being at the right place at the right time, and she evidently thought that, you know, that my mind was good enough. She said, give me some talking points to send to the publisher. <laughs> well, I had about three pages of nothing but uh, compliments about the book. <laughs> Remarkable. And I, I'm sure, I mean, look at it, it stayed with you and really um, helped to frame um, your direction and, and where you went. The, the, the kinds of people that you have met and worked with over the years, I, I mean, just countless number of people. But when you think back to some of the professors that you had in undergraduate work, graduate work, your doctoral program as well, I know you mentioned just a couple uh, just a moment ago, but um, I, I'm sure that there are experiences or moments in time that um, that stay with you. Is there some, something else during that time, Dr. Renzulli, that um, you felt like was an aha moment for you? Well, I think that um, one of the things that was important for me because of the early success of New Directions and Creativity was that one always has to keep the end user in mind when you're working on something. And a lot of researchers basically write for other research. And I must say, there's a lot of education research out there. I'm not criticizing it. But I will say that it's had a minimal impact on what goes on in classrooms. And so any research project that I work on, my end user is teachers, administrators, and policymakers. And while I want the research to be as high quality as possible so that a research journal will accept it for publication, I have no doubt that it's the practical aspects of it that have made a difference. The other thing is, that I believe uh, I've learned from my experiences in uh, Glassboro and Rutgers and later the University of Virginia is something that is a, a quote that my daughter actually has on her wall now because I told her about the quote. She's a screenwriter. And the screenwriter's motto is, don't tell them, show them. And so uh, I believe that even when working with my graduate students, Yes, they hear me lecture on stuff and ex expo expound wisdom, but almost every assignment means that they are going to do something. There's research paper number one, research paper number two, and each one has a sort of a theme to it. But again, it's, it's by uh, Paul Brandenwein, uh, one of the great, great leaders in our field, used to say, by their deeds, you shall know them by the things that they do. And you don't really develop that doing 
by just sitting and listening. And so that's why, again, my work is focused on the creative, productive end of the continuum of learning rather than the deductive, didactic, prescriptive. I think the acceleration people, and I'm not criticizing them, but I think that more material faster is still not a change in the ways that we work with young people. I'm working on a paper right now, which is a kind of a summary of a lot of other things, simply called the pedagogy of gifted education, not what we should be teaching, but how we should be teaching it. The fact, Dr. Rensoli, that you mentioned um, wanting to be sure of how the end user would be utilizing um, what you what you're speaking about is critical, I think, to those of us that that stand before students um, that are involved with gifted education right now, wanting to make sure that it, it's it's being uh, embraced in a particular way. I'm also intrigued by the fact that your daughter's a screenwriter and that she uh, embraced a quote that that you shared with her as well. That's that's pretty remarkable. Um, the 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 commitment that you have, though, um, to the work that you're doing and the equity part of it as well is where I'd like us to go next. Um, your your wide enrichment model, along with the three ring conception of giftedness, two uh, areas of work that are in really throughout the world um, and, and have been put into place with so much success. If you could, and, and this actually speaks to the, um, the, the newest legislation that was passed here in New Jersey in January of this year, Strengthening the Gifted and Talented Education Act. Um, this has been something that has also really led you as, um, you know, a, a researcher in education, a practitioner as well. Can you talk a little bit about um, that, the equity piece as well and, and your commitment to that? Well, um I'm going to begin with one example uh, of a couple I'd like to share about my teaching experience. So much comes from practical experiences, not just mine, but the, those of others that I've seen doing some things that are worthwhile replicating. Uh, and uh, I think that um, when I started teaching in the late 1950s, the Russians shot this little basketball-sized thing up into space called Sputnik. And um, I was a math and a middle grade math and science teacher, uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grades. And um, the superintendent came to me and said, uh, I think we need to start a program for our gifted students. And the school psychologist brought me a list of the students in those grades that scored 130 or above an IQ. That's the way giftedness was defined at the time. And so I started putting some different kinds of things together, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the other thing, I also taught general science classes. And I had some kids in that class that were much more interested in science. Interest to me is what makes the world go around. They had many creative ideas. And um, so one of the things I did was start to sneak some of those children who were not, quote, unquote, gifted into the uh, Saturday program. And then later we made it a we built it into the school schedule, the, the gifted program. And I do think that um, that really resulted in me finding and developing talent in kids, again, that don't make it by the traditional means. And um, it led to uh, many research studies that I did on high potential low income children. Uh, some work that I'm doing now, which I call assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning. To get into a gifted program, we measure everything that you know 
by a standardized achievement test or a teacher-made test or your grades. That tells us that you already know something. The information in my assessment for learning approach is to ask young people about uh, their interests, their preferred modes of learning, and the ways they like to express themselves. And we're currently working on some new interests that deal with uh, student engagement, executive functions. And believe it or not, we're working on a school happiness instrument because those are the things that I've seen in people who have gone ahead to do important things. Now, other influences from the early days that led to triad, and um, one of them was, um, and I wish I was the hero teacher in this, but I was, and I was a part of the team. Uh, Herb Bueller taught social studies. I taught math and science, and Rita Friedman taught uh, reading and language arts. And um, we had a young man named Paul Frankel, uh, and uh, he was in our cohort. And um, he needed some time to work on a project, which I'll tell you about in a minute, which really led to a lot of triad. But uh, he could learn math faster than most of the kids in my class. Now, I started a little thing for seat work. It was called a game. You know how problems get harder on a page of math from the top problem to the bottom problem. And you could go down the page. And I said, here's how the game works. Do the last row, bring it up to my desk. And if all of the problems in the last row are right, you're through with your math for the day. Now, that eventually led to what became curriculum compacting, but it also led to something else. I had to find out and figure what in the heck I could do math related that would fill those kids time. They're not just going to sit there. And so that began almost a lifelong experience. It goes on today. I collect resources all the time that were enrichment related materials in math. And uh, I found some really interesting things. I found a surveying set. I had kids uh, doing surveys of the playground, designing playground equipment, and all of that, all involved math skills. And so that's a lot of what a type three came from. But my favorite New Jersey story was Herb Bueller uh, as a social studies teacher. Paul, uh, Bruce was very, very interested in presidents. He'd read everything there was about presidents. He wanted to be a president someday. And so and here's a perfect example of a question. Um, the uh, teacher said to him, down at the end of Jerome and Ocean Avenues on the oceanfront, there is an old church called the Church of the Seven Presidents. Now you find out why. Well, that began what was a year-long study of he got old town maps and new town maps because a lot of the buildings, big wooden buildings, had burned down. He found out that several presidents, including the Lincolns, spent their summers there at the shore. And one of the most fascinating things he found was that President James A. Garfield died there at the seashore. A lot of things no one knew that he brought to our attention. Garfield was shot and wounded by a disappointed office state uh, seeker in Union Station in Washington, D.C., and um, he was sent by special train uh, to the seashore because, as my mother always thought, seashore air was good for your health. And they built a special track from the railroad station that my deceased father worked at to the front seashore. It's still the record building for railroads in the country. And they took him there where he lingered on through the summer and eventually passed away. And uh, Bruce wanted to find out where Jackson died. So he started looking around. Of course, the properties had all been carved up. Mansions had burned down. They built new houses. So he spent a lot of time in the town clerk's office looking at old town maps, new town maps, records, building records, deeds. And he was walking around there one day with the maps in his hand. 
and he saw a sign, a cardboard sign stuck in a garage window that said, this is the place where James A. Garfield died. Well, he was not about to let that happen. And so he started a campaign. He would give a speech wherever two were gathered. He raised money. He was. Uh, we arranged for him to speak uh, before the New Jersey, a committee of the New Jersey legislature, and eventually a piece of property about the size of two large couches was deeded over from the property owners to the state of New Jersey. And Bruce had a, had an, a monument erected there. He even uh, went up to Vermont and picked out the stone in the quarry that he wanted with the help of his father and others that were interested in the project. And so uh, I love that. And I also love a follow-up where this was written about in uh, Williams College magazine, which is where uh, Garfield uh, went to school. And he got a letter in the shaky hand of a very old person thanking him for doing that. <clears throat> I get teary-eyed when I think about this. And he thanked him and he signed it, something, something, Garfield, James, last surviving son. And so I thought when I watched Bruce, again, I was compacting curriculum, uh, involved in, in some of his research, the maps and all of that. But when I saw that, I said, this isn't something that I ever learned at Glassboro State Teachers College. You know, I learned to write unit plans and lesson plans, you know, prescribe, present, deliver. And um, so this is really where the idea for type three enrichment triad came from. But it also helped with the ideas of type one and type two. Someone had to get him motivated. And that was the books on presidents that Herb Bueller got him. He got him every book he could find on presidents. And the type uh, that was the type one enrichment, creating the interest and the motivation. And the type two enrichment were all of the skills, even his writing skills, his measuring skills, his interviewing skills, his uh, speech and presentation skills when he had to go before a New Jersey subcommittee to get a, a law enacted to, to take a piece of these people's property away for, for the national, for state historical purposes. And so all of those kinds of things we can see in there again, curriculum compacting, uh, type ones, two and three enrichment. And nowadays for underrepresented groups, especially type three enrichment, if I didn't sneak some of those kids into my gifted program because they didn't meet a 130 cutoff score, then they would not have had some of the opportunities. And they did as good or better projects as the 130 kids. And so um, one of the things I believe, and that's why, uh, again, my present work on assessment for learning, I don't want to throw out whatever we measure. That's got to have some value. But assessment for learning is the thing I think that really provides the kind of uh, tools that we need to say, take this youngster in this direction rather than this direction. And when you <laughs> Joe, Joe works fine with me, thanks. You know, Dr. Anzoli, um, let me just say that the story that you just shared with us um, about your friend, is exactly why stories that connect us is so important. Um, it moved you in a way uh, to recall this memory. It's a memory that has um, really has, it, it seems to have been embedded in the kinds of things that you look at as you are doing your research, your work. Um, it, it propels you forward. And it was a beautiful story. And, I, and obviously, it's something that I think those of us that are listening to you speak, um, it shows that human side of the person that you are and why those experiences have helped to influence all of the things that you're referencing. And by the way, our audience 
can simply, you know, go to your website, Google you, any of the things that you've mentioned, triad, level one, all of these things are things that are connected with your name and to learn more about it. I mean, we, we could talk for another five hours about it, but the roots of it are things that you're talking about right now. And that's what makes this so real and so human. And the work uh, itself becomes motivating. Yes, interests are important. But from my point of view, I had to develop a whole series of instruments. I even have them for doctoral students called interestalizers. Yeah, yeah everybody will say interests are important. But again, don't tell them, show them. I had to have an instrument. The same with the learning styles inventory, the expression styles inventory, which I named my way after the song by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. How do I like to express myself? And when I find that out about a person and the kinds of products, is it a written, constructed, dramatized, filmed, edited, whatever? There's very small general categories of products, but then within any given category, there are many, many sub-products. Many teachers of English don't know that there are 67 genres of nonfiction. It's just nonfiction. We always think, well, let's see, there's poetry, and there's short stories, and there's novels, uh, and then they run bare. And there are many, many other genres. And if you can find a genre, even writing captions for cartoons is a genre, because that's what makes a cartoon funny. And so I think finding those interests and then giving young people a, a bunch of cartoons and saying, make this cartoon funny by what you write underneath it. And by the way, every couple of weeks I enter the New Yorker cartoon caption contest. I haven't won yet. <laughs> That is so cool to know because, I mean, and again, to share that with us, to see that, look, Joe Renzulli is entering these contests as well. That's pretty amazing. That is so cool. Um, Dr. Well, Ren oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Another thing about why learning styles is important. And I must say, uh, to begin with, I was never an outstanding student. I was probably, you know, a solid B student. Uh, uh, but one of the things I knew about my own learning was that if I could see it, I could then write about it. So whenever I start on a new project, I don't have a typewriter or keyboard in front of me. I have a big blank piece of paper and I start drawing and circles and boxes and arrows and this connects to this and that connects to that. And when all of that makes sense to me and you can't make it too complicated or no one will understand it. I've seen some model diagrams that would just are unintelligible. Um, and so once it makes sense, and I'm always changing this and adding that, then I can write about it. And so one of the things that came out of all of this was my work on learning uh, on expression styles. I did it my way and learning styles as well. That's that's uh, awesome, Joe. And I, I think that, um, you know, many of us can relate to that blank whiteboard that um, that might be in front of us when ideas come to us. Why being able to illustrate it and see it first, as opposed to writing about it, helps us to um, really grow that idea. So to know that you're doing that as well gives us a lot of comfort, too. Um, I want to round out uh, the, the last portion of our stories that connect us with you uh, to allow you to talk a little bit about what's in the future, what's coming um, for the work that you're doing. Anyone that visits um, your website at the University of Connecticut, of course, can see that there's a lot that's going on. There's so much that's in motion right now that is exciting for um, the year 2021. So if you want to sort of round out um, where it is that um, you're heading, that would be a, a great place for us to sort of uh, bring our stories that connect us uh, towards the end, please. 
All right. Well, um, I can start uh, with another story, actually, um, because um, my fundamental belief, and I'm glad you mentioned the three E's, when people ask me, what are the goals of gifted education, enjoyment, which leads to engagement, which leads to enthusiasm for learning, the three E's, we call them. And uh, I also believe that schools are places for talent development, not just for identified kids, because we're going to miss a lot, especially low income kids, kids that are in schools that serve large minority populations. And so we've got to do something about that. Um, how did the school wide enrichment model get started? Well, you see, because this is a model that says we're going to do something not just for the kids stamped on the forehead with a G, but for all kids. Um, a number of different ways. Um, but one of them was I was uh, consulting in a school in Torrington, Connecticut, many, many years ago. And I found myself going there uh, more often. Do you know the movie When Harry Met Sally? Now, this is the movie when Joe met Sally. Okay. And Sally was the uh, coordinator and teacher of the gift that she taught in nine different schools and had a half a day a week to plan. And uh, I was meeting her at one of the schools early in the morning. And I came in and she was taking some of the activities that I, that I had developed in my New Directions and Creativity program where we were actually doing a research study at that school. And she was putting sticky notes on them and sticking them in teachers' mailboxes in the, uh, in the uh, teacher's room. And I asked her what she was doing. And she said, well, these are great activities. That, and we were, don't forget, we were doing research with identified kids that I think this teacher could use when she teaches a story on such and such. And it suddenly occurred to me that, yeah, we ought to be applying some of this pedagogy to other kids. And one of the things I see as an important future developer uh, of, of good programs is that the teacher of the gifted, with all the special training, all the conferences they've been to, the courses they've taken, the books and articles that they've read, they should form in a school a thing that we call the school-wide enrichment team. Selecting people, don't get two negatives on it because that'll ruin it. One, you can convert, but not two, I found from experience. We can get people that still believe that teaching makes a difference, that there's something still beating up there in their heart about teaching. And form a school-wide enrichment team <clears throat> and try to infuse the different kinds of strategies that we use, even some materials, but certainly the strategies that we use into more aspects of the regular curriculum. I have a chapter in a book that uh, Sally and I did a couple of years ago uh, for Proof Rock. It's a summary of a lot of our work. And there's a chapter in there on infusion. And um, there are ways to do that. And uh, we've even developed some planning guides that help teachers pick a topic and then say, get together as a group and brainstorm some of the kinds of things that they can do to make that topic more interesting and more engaging. And so I do believe that if gifted education has been a leader in the kinds of things that we've done with identified kids, that we should start to think about how we can change the culture of a school so that more kids can have those kinds of experiences. I think, again, putting smiles on the faces of more kids more of the days of week because they enjoy and are engaged in what they like is one of the things that I see as a prominent role and future for teachers of the gifted. Joe, I, uh, you know, I... Your words are what are words that resonate with me, and I'm sure every single person that will be listening to this uh, interview. Um, I have one more story for you. Um, th this story, and I've been asked this many times: How did this Renzulli learning system, the electronic online system, get get started? And um, very interesting. We we 
had about $10 million in venture capital to build this system. It was eventually sold to a private company, and I no longer have anything to do with the ownership. But one of the things I realized early on is you can't do the kinds of teaching that I advocate and give, have given examples of without, first of all, a very thorough profile of the individual child, not just their scores, but the other things that I've already talked about, interests, etc. And secondly, easy access for resources that can enhance what we find out from that assessment for learning profile. So I'm riding up the ski lift in Vermont one day. Remember, all of the instruments that I've corrected, interestalizers, learning styles, et cetera, a paperwork nightmare for teachers. I was probably more part of the problem than the solution because they not only had to review them, but they had to analyze them. So I'm riding up the ski lift in Vermont with a stranger, and you either talk or don't talk. So we started talking. Hi. Hi, where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I'm from New York, the other guy said. I'm from Connecticut. Uh, what do you do in Connecticut? I'm a teacher. Uh, what do you teach? I teach in the gifted program. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I'm a principal. And um, he said, we have a gifted program in our school. I even remember his name, Tony Rosano. And um, I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. And he did. And I said, how do you go about identifying your kids? And he said, oh, we use this god-awful thing called the Renzulli rating scales. I give you my word. <laughs> and he said, and after we rate the kids on, you know, their, their abilities, this Renzulli guy wants us to look at their interests, their learning style. The paperwork is driving us up the wall. Now, <laughs> how do you get somebody to ask you your name? Hmm. You ask them their name. Of course. I said, uh, by the way, what's your name? He said, Tony Rosano. And he said, what's your name? And I pulled out my ski badge. My season's pass it says it's right here on my pass. He looked at it and whew, he could have set an Olympic record going down Bromley Mountain that morning. But I realized something. Again, developing all of those instruments was part of the problem. I was on the phone with my technology friends at UConn um, as soon as I got out of the Green Mountains and could get cell phone service. And the next week I was meeting with them and they said, yeah, we can we can digitize this. You don't have to give all of these instruments. We started developing what became the profiler in the Renzulli learning system. And then we went on again to develop the databases. But um and Sally was very involved in that because she's an organizational genius. And so um, it took us, uh, again, $10 million in three years to develop the University of Connecticut in their wisdom. We wanted to keep it and give it away free. But the maintenance of one of those things is very expensive. The cu customer service and uh, getting new material and the databases and the technology, it's it just... So the University of Connecticut sold it, and so now it's in the hands of a private company. Uh, it's been sold. It's in its third owner, which happens to be somebody back in Connecticut right now. But I do believe, again, that's another problem-solving issue, that if you're part of the problem, you better figure out a way how to overcome it. And fortunately for me, it was at a time I, I'm a neophyte in technology. Uh, you know, I've it was just barely able to use my cell phone and computer at the time. But nevertheless, I knew that there was something there. And so when we talk about the future, we also have to know that there are technologies that are not even here yet, especially with artificial intelligence. And for example, in a new piece of work uh, that I've uh, just had published, it'll be out in December. Uh, called the, the catch a wave theory of adaptability, where we're riding waves now in our jobs, but that job is either going to be discontinued or change. And so, what we've got to learn how to do is catch the next wave. From my time at the Jersey Shore, I learned that the wave's going to crash, and then you go out and you catch another wave. And so, 
Uh, one of the things I believe is that there are certain core competencies, and a lot of them we've always done in gifted land. You know, the thinking skills, for example, we've really invested very heavily in. Um, I've also added to that um, research and investigative skills. In order to change anything in the world, you have to know how to do research and investigative and artistic skills as well. And so uh, what I've tried to do is to build in uh, those already existing areas with uh, the development of, of various kinds of uh, artificial intelligence. We're teaching, believe it or not, some primary grade children how to do coding. It's very simple. Coding basically tells the computer to think like a human being. And it's a very simple activities. And uh, so we're building this into uh, our system. And I believe that if there's one skill that is so important for all young people these days, it's adaptability. That what you know now it's not like in the old days, you graduated from college and you got a job and you stayed in that job. You may have went to a few in-service trainings to learn something new that's happening. But the change is happening so fast, especially in technology, uh, that we need to have built into our curriculum for the future, uh, practically a course called adaptability. Joe, I... I love how you enabled us to kind of come full circle with the the beautiful story that you shared about the principal and the fact that you related it back to problem solving. You listened to what that principal had to say. And much like we started this interview with in enabling yourself to be able to buy a new pair of shoes, you had to problem solve and pick up those bottles that were going to be two cents. As, as a, an owner of, of this learning system, you had someone that gave you feedback and you, you know, there was an idea of problem solving and you did it, you listened. Um, and, and so I think that what that says to our audience today is uh, in your story that you've not really left the, those ideas of problem solving. You've always sort of taken that on and made that part of your mission in what you have given back um, to, to so many of us. And a final note on your word of adaptability. Um, I think that we can all agree with you that things are changing so quickly that if we are, are, are unable to adapt, we won't be able to keep up. So in your final statement for Stories That Connect Us, Joe, um, just a few words on what you're hoping that our listeners today will take from your story that you've shared with us just a little bit um, and, and will carry with them um, after we've, we've ended our, our session today. Well, I think that um, the first thing is you've got to have a dream of what your school should be like, what you want it to be like. And if that dream has anything to do, again, with the kinds of things we talked about, enjoyment, engagement, enthusiasm for learning, more focus on creative productivity, then you've got to sit down with like-minded people and you've got to get administrators involved because they are oftentimes people that are hard to convince the, the, the gun at their head for state achievement test scores has really been ruinous of education. And I do think that um, you've got to think of a, develop a plan. It's going to take some time. Not I usually say it takes two to three years just to get a good school-wide enrichment program going, making room for everybody, even a teacher that wants nothing to do with an enrichment cluster, because we want all teachers to do a cluster, wants nothing to do with it. Have that person sit in as a, a co-teacher, partner, assistance with somebody that's really turned on. And we found out that the following uh, year or semester, we, do, we should do them first and second semester, the following semester, 
that they'll want to start to think about doing their own. So I do think that, again, um, there's uh, only a couple of quotes on my door at the University of Connecticut. I had about 50 there. The painters made me take them all off. But um, one of them that's a very important one is teamwork makes the dream work. And I've had the good fortune over the years of working with so many wonderful people. Uh, Sally, of course, uh, Del Sigley, Gene Gubbins, Susan Baum, Carolyn Callahan, uh, uh, um, Jeanette, Jan Lapine. Uh, the list goes on and on. And I shouldn't have started mentioning names because I'm sure I left some, some out. Uh, the other thing is you're going to hit brick walls. and um, you, when I first uh, finished the article on Three Ring Conception of Giftedness in 1977, it was rejected by all of the gifted journals. And under the advice of my dear friend and mentor, Paul Torrance, he said, the same thing happened to me when I said we could measure creativity. He said, send it to a general education journal. And the Kappen, the Phi Delta Kappen, which at the time was the most widely circulated journal in the country, uh, published it. And, he, and now I say without one ounce of modesty, that it's the most widely cited article in the field. And so I believe that, yes, you're going to hit brick walls. Someone wrote an article after Three Ring came out called Renzuliitis, a National Disease in Gifted Education. And there was a lot of reaction from the cut off score conservatives, but you're going to run into those things. And what you've got to do is learn how to win people over. And again, don't tell them, show them. When people contact me, I tell them a little bit about school-wide enrichment. Then I send them, I've got a list of schools around the country that they can mostly drive to. I send them to see it in action. And that's a better way of making change. The other thing is, um, Stay away from negativity. Uh, there are too many people that feel like they've got to write national disease articles to get their name in print. Um, think about the kinds of things that you would do that are better than three ring rather than just something negative. And uh, uh, I don't I believe that negative energy has killed more good talent than it's ever produced anybody. Nobody remembers the critic. They remember the person that came up with the idea. And finally, I believe that um, we should never in our field stop lurk looking for big ideas. Uh, I don't know what's next, what's further down the road, and who will come up with them. But now with the availability of artificial intelligence, I have a feeling that some of the younger people out there that are a lot more technologically savvy than I am, are going to come up with some things that are going to make the field better. So um, it's very hard to predict the future, but I think it's, it's a bright and rosy future because the people in gifted education have always been risk takers because we've had to go against the status quo, against the con common core content standards and uh, the, the, the rigid lesson and planning and all of that kind of stuff. Dr. Joseph Renzulli, thank you so, so much for sharing those beautiful final thoughts with us. Um, we cannot thank you enough on behalf of everyone from New Jersey Association for Gifted Children um, and Stories That Connect Us. We thank you for being a person that you are, for doing all that you have done, for influencing people not only across the United States, but uh, throughout the world with your work. Um, you have been so gracious with your time today, and we cannot thank you enough. You are a Jersey guy, and you always will be, and I know you live in Connecticut now, but we're so proud to be able to say that you were from New Jersey, Dr. Renzulli. Um, thank you so much. This has been an amazing experience. Uh, I know for myself, and I'm sure everybody that's listening today will not listen just once, but over and over again to hear your words. Thank you so much, Dr. Renzulli.
it's been my pleasure. I, I enjoyed uh, missing and and again, I like doing things where I don't have to put up a single PowerPoint. <laughs> We want to wish you and your family all the best. You take care of yourself, okay? Thank you, Mary. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.